You know, Newt, after a welcome like this, I'm tempted to say amen and turn it back around because it doesn't get any better. Uh, I want to thank you, uh, Newt, for the very kind introduction. And I want to thank all of you for inviting me to, to be here with my brothers and sisters and the Boilermakers. And before I say another word, I'd like to just take a moment to recognize the, the hard work and energy and the dedication of your president. Newt, you're a, you're a true friend. You're a man after my own heart, and I want to thank you for your, for your leadership, but most importantly, for your friendship. You've done great by me, and you've done great by all the workers out here, and we want to thank you for that dedication. And Secretary Treasurer Bill Creed, I want to thank you for your hard work and your friendship. And I got to tell you, if you're ever shooting sporting clays, you better take your President and Secretary Treasurer if you want to win because they're pretty good shots. And I want to thank uh, all the leaders in this room right now, quite frankly. First and foremost, every last one of you stepped up and you participated wholeheartedly in the fight for the Employee Free Choice Act. You invested your time, you invested your energy, you invested your money in that effort. And although we haven't yet won the comprehensive reforms that America's working people need and deserve and ultimately will have, that fight helped to bring us a National Labor Relations Board that's actually doing its job and protecting workers. And this fight strengthened and energized our entire labor movement. And you and your members have already have the benefit of belonging to a union, and yet you demonstrated your willingness to mobilize and to fight so that all workers, every last worker, could have the freedom to form a union and to bargain for a better life to have a little security and a little dignity. And I just want to say that I salute you, and on behalf of working people everywhere, I want to say thank you for all your efforts on behalf of your brothers and sisters. And while you were mobilizing, getting those signatures of support for workers' rights, who knew that we would ultimately get the national attention to collect the bargaining that we've wanted for years, thanks to an outrageous, overreaching governor in Wisconsin named Scott Walker, we were able to have that debate. Now that guy may have temporarily gotten the legislation that he wanted, but I guarantee you he wasn't counting on the reaction that he got. Because by a two to one margin, the American public believes that every worker, whether you're in the private sector or the public sector, ought to have the right to have a collective bargaining agreement and not let anybody try to take it away from you. See, that's what he hadn't counted on. But if we look around the country today, from the Midwest to the West Coast and to Washington, D.C., we've got too many Scott Walkers on the loose. You see, they're attacking every progressive voice that's out there. They do it in little ways, in big ways. They started these voter ID laws. Well, that sounds like a great idea. We'll have to show an ID. Well, let me what ha tell you what happens in Wisconsin because of that voter ID law. 24% of Latino women won't be able to vote because they don't have an ID law. 27% of the elderly won't be able to vote because they don't have an ID. 78% of African American males between the ages of 18 and 24 won't be able to vote because they don't have a driver's license. And 55% overall of African Americans won't be able to vote. And then they take on the students and say students shouldn't be able to vote. 
They take on professors. They take on workers, of course. See, they're doing that, and too many of our political leaders in both parties are stuck. They're focused on deficits instead of creating jobs, telling us that we need to make tough choices and accept shared sacrifice. But working families, young workers, seniors, people of color, poor people, and people with disabilities have been doing all the sacrificing. While billionaires get tax cuts and corporations get incentives to export more good jobs overseas. It's insane. And for the good of our countries, it has to be stopped. See, we need to be asking our leaders, who got us into this mess? It wasn't working people, I can tell you that. The people who got us into this mess are getting off scot-free and too many politicians, far too many politicians, are letting them get by with it. You see, brothers and sisters, as we look ahead, we see that the stakes for the future of working families are very, very, very high indeed. And we know that when it comes right down to it, we can't look to anybody but ourselves to get working families out of this economic mess. You see, really, it's up to you, and it's up to me, and it's up to us to build a labor movement up so that we can once again lift up all working people, like we did in the 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s so that working families can have a, a level playing field and have a full voice in the workplace and in our democracy. See, and to do all of this, we have to make our labor movement stronger. You know, the most important political action we can take isn't electing any politician and it isn't voting for any party. The most important political action that we can take is strengthening ourselves to speak out for all working people, building a power structure that can move from electoral politics to advocacy to accountability seamlessly. 12 months a year, that's an independent and overseas it owes its fidelity to only one group of people, and that's working people. So let me say this. We intend to be friends to any politician who is a friend to working people, but we will not be an automatic advocate for any political party, not any candidate, nor any elected official. We won't be their ATM machine. It's time for them to support working people, create jobs, and create an economy that's shared by everybody, not just the very few people at the very top. You see, if they want our support, they've got to earn it. And our single job, our sole mission, our sole priority is to represent the interests of working men and working women, people who work, who bring home wages, and to represent them honestly and fearlessly every single day with no caveats and no apologies. Now a lot of people think that means that we need to be harder on Democrats, and it does. 
President Obama and the Democrats have done a great deal. Not enough, but a great deal. Still, we need a lot more. And we won't be quiet about it. We need jobs. We need pensions. We need health care. We need an economy that's growing and provides opportunity for our children and their children. And we intend to hold everyone in public office accountable, regardless of their political party. And yet, brothers and sisters, let's be crystal clear about who has consistently launched and relentlessly pursued attacks on working people. Tea Party Republicans again and again and again have been a united front against us, against all working people in the country, to do all the harm that they can. Listen, it's been almost three years since our entire financial system went into meltdown. And even before that, outsourcing, downsizing, privatizing, and stagnant wages were already a plague in our communities. And then they went from a plague to an epidemic. Wages for working people are still flat and falling. 25 million people are looking desperately for full-time jobs. 24% of our teenagers are out of work. Let's be clear about who's been waving the, pla the flag of patriotism while undercutting the very values that America represents. See, brothers and sisters, this is America, North America. We can do better than this. These are our kids. They're our parents. They're our neighbors. And they're all hardworking people who want nothing more than a job that gives them a decent standard of living and a little security, a little health care, and a little pension security whenever they retire.